and welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation video podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase scientific innovation stemming from global life science companies through conversations with senior leaders who shared a unique leadership journey, corporate vision, and industry outlook. My guest today is Dr. Christy Sheehy, founder and CEO of Sea Like Technologies, Inc., a neurotech and AI startup that has created the world's most accurate retinal eye tracking device, which is the product of Christie's dissertation work, combined with advanced statistical methods and machine learning to assess neurological health and treatment. Ultimately, Sea Lights is the world's most sensitive 10 second eye tracking scan for brain health and drug efficacy testing. Christie is an innovative, passionate, and resourceful leader with over a dozen years of technical expertise in the opt optical and ophthalmic engineering realm with numerous scientific publications, invited presentations, and direct clinical research experience with neurogenerative patient populations at the top research institutes of UC Berkeley and UCSF. Christy holds both a BS and MS in optics from the University of Rochester and a PhD in vision science and physiological optics, physiologic optics from UC Berkeley. I was introduced to Christy by the amazing Dr. Sodat Adamson Fade, a fellow Nigerian American scientist who is also committed to advancing innovation and patient engagement and advocacy. Welcome to the show, Christy. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Really excited. It's, it's my pleasure. So I will start with one of my favorite questions, which is what is your definition of scientific innovation? So scientific innovation to me is, it's really the idea of bringing new technologies and solutions from a research bench in a lab to the real world. And for innovation and tech to have the ability to be impactful, um, it's really when they can help the masses. Wow, I, I like that emphasis on impact because innovation is not just innovation for the sake of it, but it has to have an impact on the populations all over the world. So now thinking through, I might guess what it could be, but what would you consider to be your most impactful professional or scientific accomplishment to date? So during my dissertation work at UC Berkeley in the vision science program, that was where I designed and built the core retinal tracking technology that we use here at Sea Light. And so wow. it really monitors minute fine movements of the eye and it uses mm -hmm. laser light to scan the eye pixel by pixel to detect wow. micron level changes. Wow, that is really exceptional. And I would love to know what the meaning is behind the name of your company, Sea Light, and, and how close do you think you are to achieving your corporate vision? So sea light actually has multiple meanings. One of them is, if you just think about seeing the light, S-E-E. -E. <laughs> um, you know, we use laser light to scan the eye, and so it's kind of a pun on that. Also, the letter C is the variable that's used for the speed of light in physics. Ah. So it's another way in which we can throw light in the equation. And, and finally, mm. it doesn't hurt that my first name is Christy as well. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of different meanings. Um, I like but, that. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And, and in terms of, you know, how close we are to achieving the corporate vision, we're actually in the midst of our seed round fundraise right now. Uh, we needed to reach 2.5 million in order to do our first close. And as of last week, we have. We've hit that Yay! Mile. So it's a very exciting time <laughs> for, for Sea Light. We can uh, we're going to do the first close before the holidays, and then we'll have 60 days to get in the, the final million for our 3.5 round. But this is a super exciting time. I'm going to get to you know, create a team of seven people to really start building this technology and, and bringing it through FDA. 
I think that's very exciting. Congratulations on fundraising. I know it's not easy, especially for women in, in any industry, especially our industry. So thank you for sharing that uh, information. Uh, now, can you provide a, a top line overview of ongoing work in your company, especially as it relates to academic industrial partnerships? Absolutely. So at, at Sea Light, we're looking to harness the power of the eye to use as a biomarker for neurodegenerative disease progression. So our entry market has been in the multiple sclerosis space, and we had our proof of concept study done with the University of San Francisco Neurology Department. Mm -hmm. So there we recorded over 200 people with MS, and we did that through collaboration um, in a small business grant that was granted by the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke. And then we did another partnership with an institution, University of Pittsburgh, Department mm -hmm. of Ophthalmology, and mm -hmm. there we looked at concussion recovery. So these early academic partnerships are really the clinical validation we needed mm -hmm. to help drive the future product development forward. And right now we are, in terms of industry partners, we have two letters of intent for uh, pharmacodynamic biomarker endpoint trials. One of them is from an MS startup in Spain that's working mm. on brain remyelination, so restoring function. And then the other is actually an ophthalmic uh, CRO company looking for exploratory endpoints. So we're still actively looking for big pharma interaction. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's definitely next on the docket. That, that's wonderful. I think Big Pharma is always, I guess, the most challenging one, but I think once you secure it, it makes things so much easier. But I love that you continue to be diversified in the way that you approach opportunity, not just here in the U.S., but ex-U.S. as well. So brava to you on that. Um, and, and switching gears a little bit, in your opinion, what do you think are some unique challenges that female leaders face? And how do you think the life science industry compares to others from a, a diversity and inclusion perspective? So for female leaders, I think it's hard many times to balance your compassion and your assertiveness in the way in which we lead, which mm -hmm. for men would be a complete non-issue. Um, and so I feel like many times for us, if we're too compassionate, we're weak. If mm -hmm. we're too assertive, we're difficult. Mm -hmm. And so on a day-to-day -day when you really should be focusing on business execution, many times you're focusing on the way in which you're delivering mm -hmm. um, a message. And so one thing I found to be very important during my fundraising and my company startup is, is just to be authentic to ourselves. Hmm. And I've dealt with many times, you know, one time I had an individual tell me that my voice was too high pitched and that I sounded <laughs> bubbly and therefore I probably wasn't going to be able to raise money because they might not know that I'm smart. Um, I've had, you know, I've had another instance where I walked in to give a pitch and, and they walked right by me to shake my co-founder's hand, who was a male. Um, and so there's definitely instances in this space where they challenge our ability to be authentic to ourselves. But I think it's, it's very important at the end of the day to present you as you, and ultimately, they can take it or leave it. <laughs> I love that. I personally believe I am not, I cannot be all things to all people. So as long as I know fundamentally that I'm true to who I am and I try to be good to people as much as possible, then the rest is up to interpretation. Um, so thinking again from a macro view, what concerns do you have about the future of the life science industry, especially as it relates to key issues such as drug pricing? So for our particular use case, for the multiple sclerosis one, I was honestly shocked to see exactly how high the drug prices actually are. So on average, drugs for MS, which is a chronic condition, are over 70K a year. And yeah. I, think, I think the minimum wage for working in the US is something like 50K. So you know, insurance becomes paramount for many of these individuals. And for MS patients where you might not necessarily have a, a, a long, you might not necessarily have a decreased life expectancy you're going to be paying for these drugs for decades. And so mm -hmm. I think within neurodegenerative disease, one of the key drivers is the research and development costs. I mean, taking out competitive pricing strategies, I think there's a huge gap in the neurological biomarkers that we have to track disease progression on a fine scale. So for MS, 
many of these trials are eight to 12 years in length. And yeah. it's, it's really because the existing tools, they just can't do the proper granular monitoring or patient stratification. So we have to wait until we can see changes as they would manifest with new lesions in the brain with MRI or things that you could see at clinic bedside. And so this is a particular area in which C-Light is looking to, to directly target those go, no go decisions to help maximize, mm -hmm. maximize IP and limit development costs. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I think if the whole process was more efficient, then the drug prices will be a lot more affordable. And I think that that's one of the key issues that a lot of people have about the industry itself, because they don't understand some of those intricacies. And this is why I get excited about featuring companies like yours on, on this platform, because I believe that's really the wave of the future. How can we take health technology tools like machine learning, for example, to inform and to expedite the, the clinical development process? So thank you for sharing that. A great example. Um, and I think you sort of pointed to this a little bit earlier, but I'll be curious to know what advice would you give young people in science, technology, engineering, engineering and mathematics or STEM, especially women who may be interested in joining a biotech or pharmaceutical company? I think that my number one piece of advice would be to find mentors, mm -hmm. particularly those in the space that you want to go be in. So using LinkedIn, doing networking, even virtually during the pandemic, there's been actually a lot of virtual <laughs> networking events. Yes. They're tougher, but they're there. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, asking for warm introductions from your colleagues, your classmates, previous professors. You know, I think early on, when I think back to my younger 20s, sometimes you didn't reach out to someone because you didn't know them and you didn't, you were nervous. And, and just based on what I know now and how important that person to person interaction really is, uh, be brave. Yeah, and a lack of response response doesn't mean that they're not interested. They might just be busy for the week too. So feel free to follow up and and just take that next step for yourself. That's really great advice. I've also personally learned to not be afraid of rejection. I you, you know this from fundraising, right? It, it, oh, yeah. it, if every <laughs> investor said yes, oh my goodness, the the first time you spoke with them, you would not have any issues whatsoever right now, would you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And, and now I'm curious to know, aside from your company and the remarkable work that you're doing, is there any other technology or company that you're currently excited about and, and why? So I was a part of the Berkeley Skydeck Accelerator back in fall 2019. And that's a program out of UC Berkeley that houses new startup companies. There's a biotech track, which I was in. And one of the companies that was in my cohort Another female founder, she is working on um, a company called Identical, and mm -hmm. it's basically a dental implant company, and it's mm. doing dental implants without a drill. So for me, that was what? really cool, particularly because I'm going to the dentist today. It's just top of my mind <laughs> to think about uh, the, the dental um, innovations. But the idea of having drillless, drillless dental implants just seems really exciting, and so that's mm. definitely one. Identical is the name. So I think that's a company to, to, to look out for. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I like when we make the impossible achievable, especially when it comes from a, a female founder. It just shows that women are fully capable of doing anything that they put their minds to. So thank you for sharing that example. And now my second to last question is, as you think broadly, what are some key consideration factors that will be important for sustaining innovation in the life science industry? So I touched a little bit upon this earlier, but that ability to have the quicker go, no-go decisions mm -hmm. are really crucial for innovation. And so I think a lot of the time in some of the larger companies, things can get tied up in bureaucracy mm -hmm. and it ends up just taking a lot longer than it needs to. So I think startups are gonna be crucial um, for helping to push that innovative um, idea forward because you're not gonna need to go through all these different hoops in order to, right, to innovate. Right. And I think on top of that, creating an innovative culture hmm. uh, is something else that's really important. So empowering employees of all positions to really think about what we're doing on the, the basic level and provide feedback and provide their own innovative ideas for the solution, whether you be chief of innovation or whether you be, you know, a, a first level engineer or scientist, I think if you give everyone the opportunities to submit ideas, 
um, I think that there could be a lot of possibilities and a really exciting way to engage the company and move things forward even quicker. That's remarkable, and, and thank you for, for sharing those thoughts. I, I would agree with you. Um, and the final question is, is very simple. Do you have any other comments or, or thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap? Yeah, so I, you know, in terms of the life science industry, I think in general, we all need to do a little bit more work in, in terms of having more individuals be represented. And I, I come from an engineering background where there were only two women in my graduating class. And I think life sciences is a little bit better than, than engineering, but I think there's still a long way to go to make sure that we, we have the ability to kind of bridge that gap. And I think what's important is that if you have a little kid out there that looks for what a scientist looked like, mm -hmm. um, it should look like them. And so I think there's a lot of work that we can all do to, to make sure the little kid in us could have found that person um, when they were a child. That's really wonderful. Um, it's making me think. Um, I grew up in Nigeria, and, and I think that my passion and desire to be a scientist was not one that my, my parents thought was like, cool. It's like, why would you want to do that? That's so difficult. So I think that by encouraging diversity of thought and, and also obviously diversity and inclusion, that would definitely be a step in the right direction. Um, but I just wanted to thank you again, Christy, for taking the time to share your, your insights and your perspectives on the Amplifying Scientific Innovation platform, and, and hopefully we can reconnect uh, in the future. Awesome. Sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Have a good day now, okay? You too. Take care. Bye. -bye.